Well, all the um, religions of the world, um, and even the secular world, has the same morality. In other words, they know what um, is the right relationship between people to have um, any viable civilization uh, that's able to gain the uh, success of cooperative endeavor. You know, whether it's the secular world or whether it's any of the religions, they know the basic principles as in, as in the what we call the Ten Commandments. They know that killing uh, is going to um, basically give such a fearful society that um, that's just intolerable. Uh, you know, if you're going to kill in order to get your way, it's uh, uh, not the foundation for civilization. They know that property rights are um, essential for um, selfish men uh, and that observing this, in other words, honesty, not stealing, is absolutely fundamental. Uh, if I step out of my house and I lose my possessions, then uh, what's the point in working? Because I don't, I don't get possessions from it. So I don't work. If I don't work, there is no civilization. Um, rules as regards uh, marriage, uh, commitment, and adultery. Adultery leaves children without parents, which leaves them with the foundation, both economic and instructional, and example, male, female roles and so on, that um, are not transmitted to the uh, next generation, your society starts to fall apart. Um, if you don't love a god of um, certain characteristics, fear and your consequent obedience, then um, what's going to hold your society together? And to cover it, of course, leads to, um, leads to stealing, taking what is another's, leads to adultery and can even lead to murder. And sometimes on a tremendous scale, and we, we've seen that, haven't we, with um, uh, ethnic cleansing and so on. If you don't honour your parents, respect them in some way, selfish parents have no future. Um, they're not going to be cared for. What's the point in having children? They go for less and less. And your ethnic group starts to decline, simply not producing enough children. Affluent people don't want the expense or the handicap of children. So something of the morality of every religion is actually um, pretty common to all religion and to all um, uh, cultural systems, whether they are recognized as religious or not. They're aiming at a morality, might be what's politically correct and so on, but it's a morality that's going to hold the state So what's peculiar about Christianity? What is it about Christianity that is Christian 
as opposed to common. Well, I think we can see it best in the contrast of the Old Testament and the New. The Old Testament is dominated by what's considered to be important, the state, in this case Israel, its preservation. And that which is necessary, understood simplistically to be necessary, to keep the state together, namely the commandments, which in a sense rightly have been seen as commandments, although they're actually principles. But from the world's point of view, they're commandments. And commandment is imposed, it's imposed by threat and fear. Fear of uh, damnation and being out of line with the ruler of the universe. This is not love for him, this is fear and respect, honour, but it's not love. And the goal is not the individuality of redemption and heaven, it's understood in the New Test Old Testament that the dead simply sleep. They wait for judgment. The New Testament, the Jesus bit of it anyway, the gospel bit, the good news, is that you can have life eternal and go to heaven, be in heaven. In fact, the kingdom of heaven has come unto you. It's at hand. You can reach out and you can enter it. It's personal, it's individual, and it's now. That's not what Judaism is about. And it's not what the other religions are about. And you can think your way through each one of them. In fact, it's not even what the Christian religion as such is about. But it is what the Gospel of Scripture is about in large measure. It's not what Paul is about. Paul justifies all that he values in terms of the Old Testament. And what's so wonderful about the Christ is that he is the personification of the perfect sacrifice, which of course is not just central to the Old Testament, but central to all world religions, even the secular world, where of course you must save now for prosperity in the future. You must go without now. You must suffer some sort of savings as opposed to spending and um, gain something that you want in the long run, in the future. Secularity um, turns acutely on selfishness, we feel, in that you um, are being offered some sort of prosperity and acceptance in your society in return for obedience and uh, a certain loss of consumption now, a willingness to save and invest in the future and go without um, in order to, you know, buy a home, be prosperous, have a good career, and a uh, long, successful life. Christianity is not that. And by Christianity now, I mean not the religion, but that which is of Jesus. I think I should call it Jesianity in some way, but I don't think I'm going to coin that sort of word. But what's in the Gospels is something different. It's a tremendous emphasis on individuality. Um, Jesus touching the lives, bringing eternal life and healing. Um, a tremendous emphasis on the miraculous. Um, In fact, very simplistically, if you want to see the difference between Gospels 
and what world religion is, simply compare Paul's teaching with what's in the Gospels. Paul refers to the Christ and none of his teaching centralizes the sacrifice, understands an individuality that is personal, yes, of individuality, yes, but majoring on being grafted in. majors on accepting tremendous hardship for a magnificent future. It's a religion that goes out into the whole world and brings in people of a kingdom, but it's a kingdom of, on earth. It attaches you to a sort of his understanding of God, that God's kingdom on earth, and it's at great price. He copies the literalism of the perfect sacrifice, and each of us um, walking in those footsteps in the literal way that is presented, namely that it can result in your martyrdom, uh, just like in the Jesus story. But that's not what the Jesus story is about. The Jesus story is about the kingdom of heaven is at hand now, you simply reach out for it, and it's within you. Um, there is an ethics in the gospel understanding, especially as seen in, in Matthew, that certainly requires, it's certainly required of you, an astonishing standard, which many Christians feel, well, obviously you can't reach this. Um, thank goodness that's the perfect sacrifice. But it's not that. When you read Sermon on the Mount, you understand an ethics that will follow from a transformation in your life. What is that transformation? It's not a working harder to keep the commandments. It's not tremendous sacrifice and cost to reach some perfect standard that Jesus is referring to. It's the consequence of a new relationship. Not a relationship of fear. Yeah. It's. Well, it is indeed perfect love casts out fear. But the perfect love comes from not a resolve concerning obedience. And it's not resting in the fear of the Lord. Is the beginning of wisdom. It's resting in a love, a love from a perceived and understood relationship. I am not adopted. I am born of God, born again. Complete mystery to Nicodemus. A pretty serious Jew. 
What do you mean? Obviously you don't mean physically. What is the spiritual meaning that you're getting at? And it is quite simply to know God, your God. This is life eternal. And Paul doesn't know his God. He would do one thing, but he does another. O oh, wretch that I am. I mean, this is a converted man. As you understand it in the Christian view. No way. No way. He is like um, John the Baptist. The least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than Paul. Just as much as the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. They're not there. They are still living an Old Testament world, ethical religion, given overwhelming selfishness. But selfishness should not lead to the epitome of selfishness. It's not about world, empire, and structure, and control, and uh, some perfect organization. A power structure. Kingdom of Heaven is not a power structure. It is a relationship and a relationship of love, not fear. Not fear to make control, but love that is life, harmony, beauty, loveliness, a tremendous willingness. Born of selfishness, yes. You know, the child born needs mum's Food, attention, care, warmth, protection, everything. Tremendous selfishness. A selfishness that's met and recognized to be met by mum, resulting in loving mum completely. Only being happy when mum's close and being very disturbed when mum is not. Jesus is not changing the system on earth. He's not tearing down Caesar and the Roman Empire. He's not even destroying the Judaic religion. He is building a family like a good, good parent. He's building relationships between our Heavenly Father and us. The Kingdom of Heaven is not out there in the world with some world structure and race that's running every other. The Kingdom of Heaven is within you. You know not what spirit you are of. You know, I'm not come to change the world. My people do not fight because they are not of this world. The kingdom that his father has is not of fear. It's of love. We are transformed into having the same values, the same will as God in terms of values. We as children of God can be incredibly creative precisely because we have values that are in harmony with the God of all.
you know, my Heavenly Father is greater than I. He's not claiming to be God. He's claiming to be a child of God. And he's claiming that we too are to be children of God and to understand God as our Heavenly Father. As I've said, he's not the first person to claim that God should be called Father. But he does it vividly in the Gospel story that we have. It's thought by a fallen world, a fallen religion called Christianity, that Matthew is strongly... Um, strong Judaic influence, law and so on. The Mark is strongly a uh, Roman type influence of, um, to the point and uh, um, a order, an imposed order. But Luke is in some sense um, uh, medical, uh, a, um, a doctor, a learned man's understanding of things, and that John's gospel is just way out. Close to being Gnostic, but not. Because, of course, Gnosticism, understanding, is not actually what the world is built on world is built on fear and obedience and continual selfishness. And you know, Jesus has not come to change that. I've not come to bring peace on the earth. I've not come to transform it. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I am the way. No one comes to the Father but by me, the essence of me, which is salvation, what my name is, just as his name is Father. God is our Father, his name is Father. From Jesus' point of view, I've given them your name. It's the only name he uses hundred, over a hundred times in John's Gospel alone. I am the way in that I am that which tells you what God's name is. I am the one that reveals to you um, what this good news is compared to the religions you've had, Judaism included. In the world you will have tribulation. The world is about that because the prince of this world is still selfishness. It's not a selfishness that has evolved into some godly kingdom. It remains of the prince, the princes of this world, who of course are the epitome of selfishness. They are the very pinnacle of wealth and power and selfishness. They are not the pinnacle of loving kindness. They are the pinnacle of control in a world of uncertainty, in a world of um, narrowness, where you are not greatly moved by the suffering of others, but immediately moved by your own suffering and pain. Now that being met, as in a good parental situation, should result and evolve into a great love within the family, a great unity. But of course our, our technology, our mobility in the modern world has uh, disassembled such unity. We don't have massive extended established families that have, say, been located in the same geographical area for generation after generation. 
we move towards an individuality, an isolation, a loneliness, a divorce from family in favour of an efficient, productive state. But the product is, of course, for those that have power. In fact, power and ownership seem to go together. I don't have ownership in the kingdom of heaven. When I look into the kingdom of heaven that's within me and that you have within you, you don't see that. You see a relationship with someone that loves you and others that love you and that you love. It's nothing to do with ownership. It's a selfishness that's transformed, transmuted. It's the alchemy into gold. Everything is prosperous. Everything is blessed. Everything is quite simply wonderful in the kingdom of heaven. It's not to be established on earth. Earth is not that, it's the, it's the school. It's the school where you have departed from the warmth and loving, focused care of your parents. And you're out there in the world learning the knowledge and ex the experience of good and evil. And the kid he knows is going to experience this when he's left at um, playgroup and uh, primary school and secondary school and college, university and so on. He's learning the outcome of being in the world, the classroom, where he learns um, the knowledge of good and evil. It's something you don't quite get in homeschool. Uh, you're protected. Uh, you're loved and understood and cared for because your parents love you. Ideally, of course, I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, assuming it really is a homeschool that's motivated by wanting to do such. And it comes as a bit of a bewildering shock if you stop homeschool and you go into the world. And you realize survival in the world is not quite what you've been trained for. You've been trained for the kingdom of heaven, not the world order and the way it works. You're an alien in it, wonderfully civilized in some way, in that your ethics are, are remarkable. But as regards conformity, you're a potential menace. Because you don't see the world as, as buying your selfishness. You see it against, as against your godliness, your relationship with a wonderful heavenly father, not a fearful worldly state. Necessary to overcome the selfishness of pretty fearful citizens. <laughs> Fearful both in the sense of uh, being pretty ungodly, but fearful also in the sense of suffering the fear of everyone else's ungodliness that's only being kept in check by a fearful state. You know, what is the essence of law and order is that um, physical force and violence 
is the prerogative of the state and nobody else. The physical force and violence is not the exercised prerogative of our Heavenly Father, our God. He does not come along and threaten you with violence and force to make you good and holy. It just doesn't. Any more than you do that with your kids if you're a loving parent. It's not your way. You can resort to it when you are desperate. But you know it's not your desired way. So what has Jesus brought in the Gospels? What's the Gospel religion as opposed to the Christian religion, which is a, well, I was going to say another form of Judaism. It's, it's the pinnacle of Judaism. It's the pinnacle of world religions. And it resulted in anything from um, medieval popes to crusades to um, holocaust. The gospel religion is a negation of all religions and secularity. For they are in the same boat, they are of this world. But Jesus' kingdom, so to speak, is not of this world. And his followers do not fight in it. He gives to Caesar what is Caesar's and cannot be bought by the prince of this world, cannot be bought with power and what we call materialism. It's a, a kingdom whose citizens are greater than John, John the Baptist. Even, you see, John the Baptist. It is not a martyrdom. You know, Jesus has finished the work that he came to do before the crucifixion crowns the story. The crucifixion quite simply says that everything in this world is finally destroyed. That what you might value of the world is simply crucified. Crucifixion is seen as the martyrdom of all martyrdoms. The final price paid for a magnificent resurrected heavenly future. It says quite simply that your passage in the universe of uncertainty, the world, is simply suffering. It's the time of not knowing but coming to an understanding of God the true God, our Heavenly Father. And if you don't get to know Him, then you need to. And that need is suffering. It's a lack. You see, everything that's bad in life is a lack. The pain that you suffer in injury is because you lack the completeness for a while of how the body's ideally put together. When you fear desperately tomorrow it's because of a lack of all the harmony that you need for peace of mind and joy and happiness and love. The crucifixion is a vivid presentation of lack, of appalling lack of destruction. The complete opposite of the kingdom of heaven. But more importantly, it draws the attention of 
the men of fear, of the people in this world who suffer lack. And if there's one thing they're sensitive to, it's appalling lack. Where the most noble is presented as the most ill-treated, now that they not only notice, but can empathize with. It draws on their heart and their experience that this crucifixion is the epitome of everything that's wrong and bad and terrible and fearful and frightening and desperate and just should not be that they find bit by bit, day by day, in the world of uncertainty, in the world where God is not understood, in the world where the gods they have are not loving, but extremely selfish, self-centered, not caring but using and exploiting and feeding off of. The crucifixion says quite simply that this life of pain and suffering, persecution and sorrow, of tasting of the knowledge of good and evil, the tasting bed, is a frightening contrast and has to be utterly destroyed. But if not destroyed in the way that the fallen person sees it, namely in some climax of pain and suffering, We're not hearing Jesus screaming, you know, I mean, apparently nailed to a cross and suffering terribly. We're not hearing him screaming, we're hearing him in rational discourse, talking to the other two being crucified with him, and them talking back rationally. We've got a Jesus who talks to his mother and makes sure she's going to be comforted, cared for by John. As her son in place of him. As regards care of the parents, which is important. It's honouring your parents, isn't it? Your mother and father, so to speak. Of course, you could say he's honouring his father totally. He's going to him. I mean, you know, his father's in heaven. His mum's on the earth and he makes sure she's provided for. It's said he cries out, but I mean, it's a funny crying out. It's not screaming out in pain and agony. It's I thirst. And, uh, well, if you're of a Gnostic frame of mind, you take that to mean that the whole of this life has brought a tremendous thirst, a desire, the necessity of heaven. And leaving this classroom well behind. And in three days from such, he says, I shall be perfected, completed, I've graduated. Have you noticed the graduation ceremonies at university are dressed in black? It's the colour of mourning. But the graduates are joyful. They know they are leaving all this, um, if you like, sacrifice and study behind. They're graduating into an adult, wonderful future. 
if you're not used to truly understanding that Jesus spake only in parables and without a parable, he didn't speak to them. If you're not used to that, then you can't understand what the crucifixion is about. You're left with a pseudo-Pauline grasp of sacrifice and cost. And you know he's gone through the most terrible experiences, shipwrecked, you know, imprisoned and you name it, persecuted. Um, Paul has suffered enormously for what he understands to be God. But his understanding of God is Judaic. He doesn't know Jesus. He knows Christ, the perfect sacrifice. And he knows obedience and the impossibility of doing it from the heart. You see, the Old Testament Messiah is the anointed one. The kings were anointed. And this is an anointed leader that's going to bring Israel to its um, zenith of ruling the world. This is very reasonable from the world's point of view. It's what the world is about. But it's not what heaven is about. It's not what Jesus' heavenly Father is about. But Paul knows nothing of this. He only knows it. Knows the Christ. The perfect sacrifice. And that is Christian religion. The gospel is something radically different. And you can't know it without the Holy Spirit being in you, by which I mean Spirit of Love. Spirit of belonging rather than being coerced. Spirit of ex complete acceptance rather than tolerating. An outsider grafted in of whom much is required and expected. And obedience is passage to that acceptance. The gospel is that you be, that you become and be a child of God, part of his family, utterly loved and cared for that you know him as your heavenly father, not as your king. Very bad connotations associated with kings, armies, force, coercion, obedience, and punishment where you fail to obey. The family is not a place of punishment. It's a place where you experience life. And the heavenly family is life eternal. And its home is within you. And that's where Jesus and your heavenly Father is. And you can be. You simply turn inwards into your true home. Home is not a kingdom of this world. Home is a place where you are safe, protected, cared for, provided for, ideally full of joy and love and peace and goodness. The presence of our Wonderful parents and brothers and sisters that love us. 
is something you've experienced in a way in childhood and need to return to. Sure, armed with a great knowledge and understanding that you gained at school, but you don't want to stay at school forever. And that is torturous. That is not life eternal. That is life in the universe of the uncertain and the transitory. And heaven, paradise, the garden is not that. Crucifixion is the termination, the end of that. The end of suffering. You know, we see crucifixion from the point of view of a fallen world, moving into what it sees as great suffering. But that's not what crucifixion is in eternity. It's the termination of the transitory the eternal heaven, the presence, the fullness of our Heavenly Father, and all the company of heaven, the heavenly host. Thank you, Heavenly Father.